Thank you very much. And uh, it is a real honor to be invited to this. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be back in Sydney for me for the, the second time, catching up with uh, uh, some old friends and seeing uh, many of you for the first time. Uh, I found this a really open uh, conference. I think it's very creative. It feels like it's a genuine conversation. Uh, and it's one I'm really, really pleased to be part of. I've been asked to come and talk about really what I'm going to start by saying is the kind of the blue perspective. Uh, we heard yesterday about all the, the red art in public spaces. Uh, we'll now think blue, and that's not political, no, uh, no political affiliation at all meant by that, but blue space, uh, which is at the heart of um, this precinct, uh, and is the perspective that I'm giving. So I'm going to think about that in a broader terms than port and think about blue space. The other, the other comment I have just before I start is the, the name of this session, Living with Ports. Uh, the conversations I've had over the last couple of days, I'm not quite sure what the kind of mindset of the project is at this stage in terms of how that phrase is felt. Do, do we think, are we thinking about that in terms of like living with a headache? Uh, is it something we have to live with, we get used to? Or is it kind of living with an old friend, somebody you really, something you really want to do? Which of those is it? And I guess I'm going to try and uh, talk about the experience from London and about how we've learnt uh, in London along the river to live with the port and see that as a positive thing in most cases. Um, of uh, tension over particular projects and issues. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through uh, a little bit of background about uh, London and the Thames. Some of that will be familiar to, to many of you, and some of that is a little bit of advertisement for the organisation I lead, which is the Port of London Authority. Lessons learned, particularly focusing on the, uh, the Docklands uh, redevelopment, uh, which has come up a couple of times over the last uh, two or three days. And then some of the sort of current issues that we're facing, uh, many of which are really resonating in terms of uh, the issues here in uh, Sydney. So, OK, I, I don't need to tell you where London is, but the point of this slide is really just to, uh, to capture the the centrality of London in terms of its location um, in global shipping lanes. So from the port's perspective, uh, which is the starting point for, for me, London is uh, ideally placed uh, on, the, on the global shipping lanes. Uh, we heard yesterday from one of the speakers that uh, London and New York are the most connected cities in the world, and that, uh, that's certainly true of air infrastructure, less so now of, of sea and uh, maritime infrastructure, but nevertheless still pretty well connected. Now, the, the Port of London Authority has a very uh, big jurisdiction. It covers the, uh, the whole of the tidal Thames uh, from a little obelisk in uh, West London at Teddington uh, all the way through the, uh, the centre of London, through uh, the, the bit of the river that looks like EastEnders, if anybody has ever watched that uh, BBC uh, uh, sitcom, not sitcom, BBC um, drama, and right out into the North Sea uh, where the, uh, uh, the Port Authority has jurisdiction. Now, we, uh, I think of it, uh, and I've been in this job now about a year, and I've begun to use the phraseology around three rivers in one, uh, because it, is actually, it does actually feel like three very different places. Um, at the one end, you've got, uh, it's very green, it's very leafy, it feels like a, a river, uh, and that's the centre for UK rowing and lots of other uh, recreational activities. Uh, then uh, down at the other end uh, is the estuary, uh, and there you've, we've got a, an, uh, an E-class container ship, the biggest ever ship to call on the Thames, which was uh, last week. Uh, and then, of course, there's the historic centre of London, and there are three very, very different sort of feels to the location and give rise to different uh, sort of stakeholder issues. Uh, and the last bit of context, which is that uh, uh, we're not very big in port terms. We're pretty insignificant these days. Uh, so I'll take you through some of the history in a minute. But at the moment, we're 89th in terms of port tonnage. Uh, and so uh, you may start thinking, so the port's not very important. And I'm going to try and persuade you otherwise. Now, a bit of uh, history and lessons learned in terms of development. So London was the, the sort of early adopter of uh, um, enclosure of Docklands uh, at the very, very start of the 19th century. Uh, and uh, for 100 years, was sort of preeminent in terms of its uh, enclosed docks. Um, the Port of London Authority was established uh, in 1909. There were precursor bodies. Uh, and it was the world's biggest port and remained so until the Second World War. Uh, the peak of port trade happened in the 1960s. And then just after that, uh, big development in terms of shipping was containerization. Uh, and the first uh, container ship arrived at Tilbury, which is the main port uh, facility, in 1968. 
And that, uh, because of the size of ships and because of the new, uh, the, the nature of container ships, uh, led to the, the closure of the, uh, the, the, the docks in the, uh, towards the center, city center, starting in 1969 and finishing in 1981. Now, if you like this, uh, if you put this in kind of graphical terms, it's been a sort of a rise and a fall and then a rise again. And whilst now trade is very different, in 2013, uh, what we have now is uh, record uh, intraport trade, i.e. movements of freight along the river, um, and a record number of passengers using the river. So a very, very different sort of use of the port, but nevertheless uh, growing. Now, just to bring that a bit to, to life a bit with some pictures, so 1930s, this is the, the heart of the empire uh, and an incredibly busy uh, 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 use of wharves and stevedoring and thousands and thousands of people employed. Uh, the PLA was the second biggest employer in the country uh, with about 60,000 employees at that time. Uh, 1964, those are the royal docks, uh, still, as I say, the, the zenith of the, the, the tonnage. Containerization happening in 1968, and there's the picture of it. And then we have this long period leading to, to real dereliction and, uh, a, and a sort of feeling of complete decline. And that was really pretty dramatic in terms of the numbers. So uh, over, that, over those decades, over 80,000 jobs lost, uh, massive depopulation in the, the whole of inner London, but particularly the, uh, the boroughs which were uh, directly affected. Uh, and uh, by the end of that period, 8.5 square miles, which on my uh, little Google, Googling this morning to compare with the 80 hectares, is 2,300 uh, hectares of uh, riverside land derelict at the east of the city. So an absolutely vast area of, uh, of dereliction. And at that point, um, the, uh, the government, newly elected government in 1979, uh, had one Michael Heseltine in it, um, who had this big vision to regenerate the whole of the area and set up the uh, London Dockland Development Corporation. Uh, and I know uh, Jackie, who spoke yesterday, worked with the LDDC at the start, and some others of you may have done. Now, why did the LDDC model work? I think it's worth pausing on this, because I think there is a big question which came up in the discussion this morning about how is, how is the development of the Bayes precinct going to be made to happen? What's the right balance between democracy and consultation and powers to drive through all of that and get things done? Now, the model of the, uh, the LDDC was incredibly top-down and incredibly uh, directive. So the, 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 the authority had powers to, it took away all the planning powers from the local boroughs uh, and uh, uh, had planning permission uh, granting powers. It, could, it had all the compulsory purchase powers. Uh, it had powers both across the land use and transport. Uh, and it could remediate and dispose of land, which was all placed into its ownership, mostly land from the, uh, from the Port of London Authority, which was uh, um, forcibly gifted to the, uh, to the LDDC by my predecessors. So in current language, uh, the LDDC was given the power effectively to placemake, um, but didn't have to really do it particularly in partnership. It did it because it was told by the government, you hear us the powers to do it, and then crucially, given a large amount of public money as well. And I remember this is the Thatcher government. Uh, monetarist policy was at its height. Uh, small government was the order of the day, uh, but not in this project. There was a, a, a clear understanding that, uh, that this needed sort of Keynesian-style uh, public investment. Uh, that's 1.8, 2.2 billion pounds of public money in 1980s money. Huge amount of uh, public money. And this was very much to, to make sure the land in particular was uh, shovel ready. Uh, there was no attempt to get the private sector involved uh, until the land had been remediated uh, and until some of the basic infrastructure was provided and there was a vision for the transport infrastructure. That was the sequence. Uh, and that's why the private sector then, when it came in, came in in a big way uh, and brought a lot of uh, you know, multiples of that sum. But that public money was, was, was absolutely critical to it. Now, what do we see as a result? I'm not going to uh, go through uh, London in much more detail, other than just to sort of put that up there as an sort of iconic image. Uh, that's uh, what happened as a result of all of that uh, uh, effort. Um, and it shifted the whole of the center of gravity of London um, to the east. And I guess you could now call it a river city, because the whole of that, bound, uh, that, uh, uh, that area of Greenwich, from the, uh, the O2 Peninsula there, round to historic Greenwich and the Isle of Dogs, um, is all uh, bounded by the river. 
Now, a few lessons from that. Um, so I think I, uh, and I was involved in this before I joined the PLA in central government in the sort of the tail end of the LDDC. Um, and I think the academic literature is pretty consistent on this, that it was the only way to do it. Um, it would not have happened um, if it had been left uh, to the uh, local boroughs, not least because there was no citywide governance at that point, uh, or else the citywide governance was, there was sorry, there was still the, the, the Greater London Council, but it was not uh, supported by central government, uh, and it was in its own uh, sort of end of era period. Uh, all of the boroughs disagreed about what the vision should be, and so without a single body to bring it together, it would not have happened. The funding was obviously essential, uh, and I think it's true to say that this shifted the whole paradigm of development, and many of the uh, uh, inner city projects that have happened since have followed um, the LDDC model. However, and this is where I, I guess the port perspective comes in, and this is very much looking back with hindsight, um, I think, uh, and uh, again, there's good literature on this, that there was not enough thought given at the time to the interface between uh, the water uh, and the land. Uh, the master plan was almost silent on the river. Uh, and when you look now at the uh, way in which the river has been revitalized, which I'll come on to, it seems extraordinary, really, that it was sort of neglected. It was seen as a, an encumbrance, a barrier to getting from north to south and east to west. Uh, and really just a nuisance. And, uh, and that was a, uh, a gap in the thinking. Uh, secondly, the part of the reason for that, I think, was that the, uh, the, the, the organization which was charged with the governance of the river, the Port of London Authority, was in a sort of state of shock. Um, this had been a sort of period of massive decline. Uh, the organization had lost tens of thousands of staff. It felt like an organization in retreat and therefore uh, didn't really have a voice, wasn't uh, seen as having a role in the thinking for the future. It was about how to deal with the legacy of the past. Thousands and thousands of dock workers unemployed, huge pension deficit, and so on, some of which has issues still with us. And so there was no real voice from the, uh, from the harbor and the, uh, the marine perspective. And I think it's fair to say that too much was lost. Uh, and just a couple of examples of that. Now, of course, the truth is that a lot of the infrastructure, and I don't want you to over-interpret what I'm saying, a lot of the infrastructure had to go. There was clearly no economic future for the scale of wharves along the, uh, the old enclosed docks. And however, in stretches of the river, um, the, the entire infrastructure was lost. There was absolutely zero uh, uh, dredged berth left and zero, uh, zero economic uh, activity. Uh, and here's just one example which I'll show you, which is a, a site called Express Wharf. Uh, and there it is, um, fully operational and actually returning a good uh, profit in its final year of operation and now. Now, that happened all up and down the river. And you could say that in any individual case, that that uh, may have made sense. When you then look at the whole and ask the question, uh, was uh, enough attention given to the economic infrastructure? I would say not. OK, so I'm about halfway through now. And I'm now going to come on to the sort of the current uh, situation uh, and uh, some of the sort of issues that we're facing, and then try and bring that uh, back to the, what I've seen, and very much from an outsider's perspective uh, in the base print seat over the last uh, three or four days. So first of all, um, a kind of where is the economy of the port now? Uh, and uh, I think the point I want to make on this slide, the most fundamental point, is not to underestimate the scale of uh, economic activity and wealth creation that is generated by uh, the, the port sector. Now, in the, to the total, uh, what this chart shows essentially is um, uh, obviously the Thames in the middle there, uh, and uh, all of the riparian boroughs, the boroughs along with the, with the river front, and the, gr and the yellow and red dots are all uh, active terminals of one sort or another, uh, ranging from the new D DP World site down at London Gateway, uh, Port of Tilbury, which is the biggest terminal on the river, uh, right up to some of the uh, smaller wharves uh, in the uh, leafy bit uh, up the top. And, uh, and then it's based upon a piece of economic analysis, which is about eight years old now, which estimated the number of uh, the jobs and the GVA sustained by each of those facilities. Uh, and the total was 3.7 billion pounds and 46,000 jobs. Uh, and that's both sort of direct on the wharves and in the supply chains. But I think what's interesting is that Whilst most of that is in the, the east end, I guess your equivalent of Botany Bay, uh, there are 
pretty substantial economic activities even up this end. So if we take the borough of Wandsworth, which is very much in the uh, uh, suburban uh, and uh, leafy end of the river, um, 23 million pounds of, of, um, of directly, direct economic activity in the port and 400 jobs. Greenwich, a similar 400 jobs and 56 million, um, 56 million pounds of value. Now, uh, you know, those are not huge sums, but nevertheless, the point is that not to neglect them and not to exclude them from the analysis. And the final point on this slide, though, is that this is really, really inadequate. So what, um, what uh, we are kicking off at the moment is a piece of analysis to try and capture all of the intangibles which aren't on here. And we talked a bit about this yesterday. What it doesn't attempt to value is uh, the jobs in the less traditional sector. So this is sort of port industrial focus. What about the, the jobs sustained by UK rowing, which is an incredibly thriving sector? Um, Stand-up paddleboarding, I'll come on to some of this. There's a huge recreation sector, which is not even thought about here, because that wasn't what the PLA saw as its job uh, eight years ago. And then, of course, even broader sort of benefits, the quality of life benefits, the value added to Riverside properties. There is some analysis based upon anecdotes, a small case studies of you know, what, what does it add to a property to see stuff happening on the river. Um, and you can value it. And actually, people do like to see uh, activity. Uh, and so there is a whole kind of intangible quality of life benefit as well, which, uh, which is, needs to be valued to come up with a full appraisal of the, uh, the, uh, the, the value of the port activity. Now, so the next, uh, I'm just going to sort of highlight a few issues now. Um, so firstly, the value of retaining port operations. So, um, this has been a real growth area in the last, um, uh, the last five or six years, which is uh, freight on the river. And this is uh, uh, the uh, site in Wandsworth, which takes most of West London's waste uh, down in barges to uh, a combined heat and power plant, which uh, provides electricity for 100,000 homes in the east of the city. So it's a, a really good sustainable project, government supported. Uh, and, and all of that is transported by river. Uh, each barge takes... 20 lorries off the roads, and if you drive around London, you realize the value of that is enormous. That's about half a million lorry movements a year. And what does that need? Well, it needs fundamentally uh, some infrastructure. Some, it needs berths, and it needs wharves. It's pretty simple, really. Uh, those two things are needed. And therefore, we have in planning policy, from central government through the, uh, the Greater London Authority to the boroughs, a policy called safeguarding which essentially um, is retaining the, the wharf infrastructure. Uh, and that policy has uh, only been introduced in the last 10 years. And it was introduced because there was a perception that, as I said earlier, all of the, uh, the infrastructure was being lost. And what it's meant, crucially, is that there's been new projects that have been developed on the back of that infrastructure. So this is um, outside Battersea Power Station, uh, which is a massive uh, uh, development project which is uh, getting underway. Uh, and uh, virtually all of that uh, project infrastructure is supported by river transport, uh, both the, uh, the spoil going out and the uh, uh, material going in. Likewise, the Thames Tunnel, which is the, 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 the solution to London's sewer, sewage problem, which is a huge new 3.5 billion investment under the river just starting next year. Again, all of that will be transported in the river. Now, without the wharves, that couldn't happen. So uh, the, uh, the foresight of the policy to establish those has led to new activity uh, which wasn't expected at the time. That is pretty controversial. I have uh, developers knocking on the door, not every week, but at least every month, coming to talk to me about particular wharves and saying, look, you know, come on. London's got this huge housing need. You know, we can put some fantastic, you know, 3,000, whatever it is. I had one just before I came here. Uh, you know, why on earth are we, are we, are we retaining this, this stuff for, you know, aggregates and mud and God knows what? Um, and the answer, of course, is that, you know, that there, are, uh, there are a huge number of opportunities elsewhere, and nobody denies the need for housing in London. Uh, but actually, you also need some economic infrastructure, and you can actually have both together, as I'm going to come on to. 
Now, part of the solution to, to uh, and why we've got to where we've got now is that there is now a much better partnership between uh, the Harbour Authority and the, uh, the mayor and the boroughs. There was a very bad relationship uh, uh, five, ten years ago, and now that partnership means that there's more working across boundaries, and that policy, therefore, is uh, supported by the, uh, the city. And fundamentally what we're trying to do now is through that partnership is to say, look, let's look at solutions where you can actually have both these things together. And I'm just going to dwell on this case study for a, a couple of minutes. And this is um, the Greenwich Millennium Village, which is a, a follow-up to the uh, development of the peninsula um, for the Millennium, obviously with the, uh, the O2 centre, which was the Millennium Dome uh, at the top there. Um, the Greenwich Millennium Village is 1,750 1, houses down here. Now, the interesting thing is, in terms of uh, the, the base precinct, I think, is that there is the largest aggregates wharf in Europe. Uh, uh, around a million tons a year of aggregates come in with its own railhead. And right there next to it is this uh, housing site. Uh, and there you just see the, uh, see the sort of scale of the ships coming in with the uh, O2 behind and Canary Wharf behind that. So it uh, looks pretty industrial at the front there. This is the site in more detail. This is the, uh, this is the, these are the housing units. Uh, up uh, to the, uh, there's the river up the top there. Uh, there is an access road, and there is the, uh, the terminal for the aggregate hall. So literally cheek by jowl. Now, how's that been achieved? The reason it's essentially been achieved by fairly simple, and I'm not an architect at all. I was on a panel this morning with uh, virtually all architects, so I, I'm now slightly embarrassed to show this because I think I'm not sure that we'll, how, the, how they will view the, uh, the design of this building. But nevertheless, it's pretty simple, really. It's, this is uh, this is high. This is this is valuable housing. Um, it's sought after, and essentially along this is along the top there uh, is the access road. Uh, and all along the apartments uh, uh, on the back is essentially hallways and uh, n n uh, not room space. I'm sure there's technical terms that I'm not, not using. Um, but essentially, it means that there's no, uh, there's no bedrooms, there's no living space which backs over the wharf. It's pretty simple. And this is the elevation of it. Uh, so this is the uh, looking at the front of the building. So we've got balconies. And it uh, looks, yeah, I'm not sure I would sell this as the greatest ever urban design. But um, it's, it's uh, the, the access is to the front. And at the back is, uh, is sort of is utilitarian. Uh, and it backs onto the wharf. Now, of course, what that means, it then creates a big shield. And the rest of the site um, is, then, uh, is then not uh, uh, affected at all by the, the wharf. Uh, and the housing can come right up to the boundary of it. And I think that is a good illustration. It's just being built at the moment, and there is a, uh, most of the units are already, uh, already sold, or there's interest in them, uh, that these two uses can absolutely coexist together. Uh, now, another uh, aspect of the growth in recent years has been uh, passenger services. Um, and uh, it was 2 million at the start of the last decade. Uh, we've got a goal to get to 12 million by 2020. Uh, and in this year, we're just about to hit 9 million. So two, 2 million to 9 million. Now, I absolutely agree with the comment yesterday that this is, this is not a mass transit solution. However, it is part of the solution. And it's also part of that overall value of the neighborhood. And these, uh, there's, there's several things which are contributed to that, one of which is the quality of the, of the boats, the quality of the investment, and the Thames Clippers, who are the major, um, the major operator. Um, they're really nice boats. They're catamarans. They go at 30 knots when you get through Tower Bridge. It's great fun. You can get a cost of coffee on there. You get a seat. People use it even though it takes longer. Uh, so it's a genuine passenger service. As I, when I talk to Transport for London, they say yes, but it's only as much as one bus route. You know, so don't, don't uh, overstate it. True, but don't neglect it either. Now, what do passengers need? Well, fundamentally, they need uh, two things. They need, to, they need a pier and they need a boat. Uh, so as well as the, uh, as the, as the, as the investment in, the, uh, in the, uh, the vessels, which has come from the private sector, uh, the piers uh, are, are publicly supported, pub publicly funded, and have had a huge amount of investment. And this has had to be retrofitted in many cases. The, the, the River Action Plan, which you saw Boris Johnson holding earlier, is largely about uh, finding space for piers, which were lost when the master planning was done for the East End. So we, there's a real shortage of access to the waterfront in the, uh, the redeveloped area in the East. Central London's fine, but in the East it's really difficult. And that's because, as I said, there wasn't enough thought given to the potential growth in the future. 
Uh, growth of the new marine leisure economy. So, I mean, this is really where it's all happening. This is where the excitement of the energy is at. There's a, a number of pictures there. They, the, the, that's a hippo, which is, uh, which is part of the, the Thames Festival, which was uh, this year. Attracted three million visitors, uh, a million to, uh, to Greenwich and two million elsewhere. Uh, added a huge amount of footfall into, to the economy. I, I always think it looks like a dog rather than a hippo, but it is a hippo. Um, stand up paddle boarding. Uh, there's a uh, rowing in the, what's called the Great River Race, and the Tall Ships Regatta, which we had this summer, which was uh, 50, 50 tall ships, absolutely magnificent, uh, which has attracted a, a huge number of people to, uh, to the river to see what's going on. Uh, and all of this you know, has, a, has an economic impact, which we currently don't value enough. And then lastly, in terms of sort of developments, uh, uh, the lady who loaded this slide for me said she, she thought this looked like Rivendell out of uh, Lord of the Rings, which is, uh, what this, is this is basically a, new, this is a, this is a project which is happening uh, and, and should be starting to be developed next year uh, called the Garden Bridge. Um, Greece, green space meets blue space. Um, it's got some public funding. It's got some treasury funding. It's got some, some city hall funding. And it's got uh, philanthropic funding. It's a 125 million pound project. Uh, and you know, it is going to absolutely uh, bring life to that part of the river. It's fairly near to the Tate, Tate Modern, which we were talking about earlier, uh, and brings a whole new sort of dimension to the, uh, to, to the river. Uh, and uh, I think that you know, it is one of the things which will uh, demonstrate, I think, the value of uh, the river and the uh, communities which look towards the river rather than away from them, which was the, uh, the, 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 the picture uh, five years ago. OK, so my final message then, there's a couple of minutes to go. Um, and I think these are all pretty relevant to the, uh, to the Bayes Princeton. First of all, it's not either or. I, I really think that uh, we've discovered in London that you can have both. You can have industrial use and residential use and commercial use and recreation all pretty close together uh, with clever design and clever minds being put to that task. And I really don't think you have to make that trade-off in every case. And I think there's a, you know, what does that mean for the, uh, for the concrete batching plants? That's for you to decide. But I think the reality is that you shouldn't go into that thinking it can't be one or the other. Don't undervalue the marine economy. I think that uh, the, the, the economic appraisal needs to take a full account of what the marine activity contributes. And that's not just the, the, the jobs on the wharves, but the, uh, the jobs supported in the supply chains. The dragon boats, you know, how much does that activity add to the, the place um, of the bays and the people wanting to go there. I value that uh, fully. Working across boundaries, and I think I mean two sorts of boundaries here. Firstly, uh, the, the, the physical ones, so joining up the marine space and the, the land, you know, what sort of development is going to make sense of the harbour, make, make the, the asset of the harbour really come to life in the development, but also working across organisational boundaries. Uh, and if the, if the bodies which are in charge of the water uh, and the bodies which are in charge of the land, uh, A, don't talk to each other, but even going beyond that, actually don't have a sense of what they would like to see in each other's jurisdictions, if you like, then it's very difficult to get that sort of partnership. So I think you need the harbour authority to have vision for the land and the riparian boroughs to have vision for the harbour, and then they can have a good conversation. Use the past, but don't be bound by it. This, I mean, fantastic examples in London. Uh, we saw a lot this morning of you know, old buildings being put to, uh, to, to great modern uses. Um, and also to think about the, the industrial infrastructure, uh, which is valued by some people for its own sake, for its heritage value. Does it mean it has to stay exactly where it is? Not necessarily. Um, but maybe there are other solutions which retain some of that, but in a different way or in a different place. And the last thing is future proof. I think, as I said earlier, the, uh, a, lot of what was, uh, a lot of what's happened in the last 10, 15 years wasn't anticipated when the master plan was designed by uh, the LDGC in the early 80s. Uh, now, it's very hard to think 20 years ahead, isn't it? But actually, uh, if there can be some capacity, some thought given to how uh, uh, sustainability challenges and other challenges might develop, and therefore what might be needed by way of uh, marine infrastructure in 20 years' time, uh, then uh, the people here then will look back and uh, thank all of us. And the last sort of image to leave you with, I guess, is the sort of the old and the new. Um, you know, this is uh, the, you know the London Olympics sort of you know gave London a new uh, a new profile in in in, in the uh, in the eyes of the world, uh, and it used the river. And so you know what a great sort of image to finish on, which is the uh, the, oh, the heritage of uh, the Tower of London there. 
using the waterway, new economic activity, uh, bringing life to London, which is a living port. Thank you very much.